like it. I didn't hurt myself. I used a cup hand and I used the energy in the ball and just kept directing it forward. See, as it bounces and comes forward, it still has energy. But as it's dropping, it's losing the energy, keeping me in control. And therefore, all I have to do is hit on it to the front. Watch again. See? Watch again. So, 
You might ask yourself, if this is like five feet from here to here from the service box, and it's 20 feet from wall to wall, you must have a wide degree of discretion in deciding where you're going to serve from. Not true. There's only two important areas, in my judgment, in singles, where the service should take place. One of them is this spot where I'm standing right now. You know why? Because my receiver, if he has any skill at all, is going to stand someplace in the middle back there, equidistant from both side wall. He doesn't know where I'm going to serve the ball, so he better be in the middle to go this way or that way, depending on where I serve it, right? But here's my advantage. Not only do I know where I'm going to serve this ball, but I also know if I serve it behind my back, my body will block the ball for that brief moment. I can put different spins on it. It's going to be like a magician. Okay? Until later on, we're going to talk about how you put the spin on the ball. You know, going over it to make it jump that way, going under it to make it come this way. All these are important considerations for serving. The only thing I want you to think about now is this is the prime spot for serving successfully. All the champions I've known, but with one exception, and I'll tell you the exception and why he was an exception. Joe Playtech, Jimmy Jacobs, Vic Hershkowitz, Fred Lewis, Paul Haber, Natty Alamada, and John Bike. Bike being another exception because he's left, but the principle still holds true in a mirror way. They all stay here. We play tech, powder the ball with tremendous ferocity on a bigger board, as I mentioned to you before. Hershkowitz always stayed here, and he hit the ball to the wall, disguising it for a moment. He'd have what's called the natural hook on it. So as it came behind his back, it would move, sort of glide and spin into that side wall. Jimmy Jacobs stood at the same spot, and he would give it the same twist as Hershkowitz sometimes, but other times he would go over the ball, reversing it. So as it was disguised on its way to the wall, it would appear that player would think it was going into the wall, but because of the spin, it straightened out and paralleled the wall, and he had no shot at that at all. Okay? Now the other box serves him up and down the lines. He didn't use any book services. John Dyke, most powerful, gives it everything he's got. Left him, zip him over the short line, zip him behind his back. Just intense power from this position. As a left lead, he would be over there. It's a mirror image. There's one exception to all this. Oscar Rowe. He was in such command of this game that he would stand over there and dare his opponent to return his serve. He hit that ball with such ferocity over this short line to this angle low. Even though the player was right-handed, he could barely touch that shot. If he got it back to the wall, Oscar would come in and kill him with the side wall front wall, that side One exception to even us, and he went on to win 42 national championships, one ball, three ball, four ball, singles and doubles. He played against Jacobs, and he noticed the weakness in Jacobs' game. Jacobs, for some reason, was overtrained with his left hand. He was so powerful with his left, and so most guys thought they were playing his weaker hand, they were actually playing his strength. But there was one shot he couldn't take. The one shot was Oscar serving over here, and I'll show it to you in a little while. Hit the front wall side wall, bounce, then hit the other side wall, and would come up about shoulder high and gently to make it just return it like that. That's all Oscar needed to go in and roll the ball up. That was absolutely incredible. Another game happened at the 92nd Street Y. There was an exhibition game between Oscar and Jimmy Jacobs, two great, great champions. Jacobs in the Hall of Fame, Oscar in the Hall of Fame. Jacobs got 20, Oscar had 18. Before Jacob served for the final point, he rubbed the ball like this, looked back at Oscar, and said, I only serve, save this serve for her shoulders, as he continued to rub. The gallery was full. They didn't know what to make of it, but it seemed to be like a bit of degradation in athletic. 
disguise. Jacob took the ball, bounced it just like this, had a reverse spin on it, which meant it went over the ball. It went over the short line, and it was moving into that right wall. Oscar didn't make a move at the beginning during the whole talking part about I saved this serve for Hershowitz. He just stayed there facing front as a receiver. As he saw Jacob hit this ball with the reverse going into the wall, my brother didn't go over and hit it side on. He merely went over it as the ball was going in this direction. He backhanded it like this. He backhanded it off the back wall. And now we traveled all the way to the front where Jimmy was coming in to put it away from the last point. But as luck would have it, it hit the very bottom of the wall and rolled out. Oscar picked up the ball, didn't turn to his opponent and say, I say only this serve for Joe Playtech. Just took the ball, rolled out three points, and won the match. That was a classic. You know why it was a classic? It was Oscar Ober is a classic. Nobody will ever touch his record. We're talking now about John Pike having won the national singles in three wall and in four wall, and it's a momentous record. All you have to do is look at the record book, and you'll see that Oscar has 11 grand slams. Singles and doubles played in the same week. One wall, three wall, four. Would have had more, but he always let his brothers win some championships. Why is he a classic? He had never won a championship in his life. We entered our first national singles championship. As luck would have it, I made the finals. My brother Oscar made the finals. I was 19 years old. I was in awe of my brother with his great skill. He was great. He was at that time 23 years old. What a mountain of power. He could hit it with both hands, kill the ball from any spot on the board. We got into the finals, and you know what? He let his younger brother win the first national championship of the older brothers. Now people say, did he really do that? You bet he really did that. He was so proud of me getting to the finals and eliminating some of the top competitors. As a matter of fact, I was in trouble in one of the preceding rounds. I was taking everything off the wall and killing it. One reason. The second game I started following him. My brother came over and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to play. He said, stop doing what you're doing. What did you do in the first game? I had already lost the second game because my opponent was in great shape. So I was following, I was getting tight, he was getting strong. My brother Oscar says, do what you did in the first game. I went out, I hit the ball low to the sky, he returned it, I killed it in the corner. And voila, my brother was right. I beat the guy, made the finals, and as a reward, my brother why am I telling you? I'm telling you that because I have great brothers. I'm telling you that because they were imbued with sportsmanship. And that's part of this game. To bring out the very best of people physically is not enough. You've got to bring out the very best of people emotionally and socially. So what we're going to do is we're going to translate this game from clinics and things like that from the high schools so we can get kids involved to use that high level of energy that they have to re-channel it into a better ways of doing things. Getting a school body, yes, but hopefully getting them to study too so they'll have a sound mind and a sound body. Okay? So, I've taken a little bit of field, but now I'm going to show you and continue on with the service technique. This is the best place to serve. Now, having said that, Hold it with your left hand, and if you're not satisfied that the balance is correct, we're going to first start with the side arm shot. The serve I like best is behind the back with a spin that goes toward the wall. Okay? In other words, I hit the front wall, it bounces behind me, and then it goes spinning into that left wall. My opponent is a right hand. How do you do that? How do you master that serve? Well, it's trial and error at the beginning. First, you have to practice some shots in order to develop 
that a number of times, I see the reaction on the wall. So what I'm going to do now is if I wanted to swing into that left wall, I gotta in some way to the left of my body, I have to hit the wall with the spin going under. So when it hits the floor behind me, it'll go into the wall. It takes longer to explain than actually to do. We're gonna do it a couple of times. You bounce the ball and you keep control of it, bounce it, and then you just like that.
Unfortunately, that took so much energy in a week long nationals that he got sort of tired and on weary by the time he got to the quarters, and then there was no real strength or power to carry him on. A wonderful competitor, one more three or four world champion singles ago. Tremendous guy, but that was his pet serve. If that was his pet serve, and none of the great champions used it, we're going to have to dismiss it just as a law or as a power play which satisfied him personally, which he believed he could take to win the title. It never happened. So I don't think that's a good serve because if you miss the crotch, it hits the floor or the wall, the power is taken out of the wall, and it becomes a hanger or a setup for the opponent who's coming into play. You have to be very skilled, it works earlier in the tournament, but when you get on where you're tired, because of the stress of going on to higher levels of play, it doesn't seem to work out. So I don't urge that. But I do urge this one, which is another favorite of mine. You stand in the same position as Monty did. You bounce the ball, controlling with your left, and now as you come forward, you bring the top spin on it. You don't hit it so it'll go into the wall. You hit it so it'll hit the floor behind you. And as it hits the floor behind you, the spin changes. Instead of going into the wall, which the receiver will think it will, it just straightens out, hits the back wall, and comes forward parallel to the wall. It's something like this. Bounce the ball, you're in control, and you hit it right behind you. See what happened there? And you just use that information to get it closer and closer so it'll parallel the side wall after it hits the back. There's another excellent serve. It was a miss too, but since I hit it with enough strength, it would still serve a purpose. But I'm not going to show you how all these great serves are made. Why? Because it's almost impossible for one person, one player to master them all. What you really have to do is master a great serve. Not like the body that paid it to serve, which didn't prove fruitful. But the serves are the greats. Standing there with the low ones, standing here with the low ones, and concentrating on that one bread and butter serve. And after you get that bread and butter serve, keeping your mind open to continue practice to get some other auxiliary serves. Because there's going to be an opponent who shoots to that serve. And then what are you going to do? Just hand him the ball and he wins the game? So, with these low serves, you can hit it low over to that side, left and right, behind your back to the reverse. You can stand, you won't get into this one, but now you can use your overhand. Remember when you practiced the overhand? You bounce the ball like this, and you remember you control the ball like this,